From the Columbia University Language Resource Center, this is Said and Done, the podcast about languages and the people who speak them. This is Said and Done. I'm Chris Kaiser, and joining me is Richard Payne, who teaches anthropology at the City University of New York, Queens College. I interviewed Richard about how a chance encounter led him to spend two years living in a small village in Indonesia called Nkuni Pasek, which is on the island of Borneo. In part one of this conversation, we'll talk about Richard's journey to and initial observations in this village, and how he learned to speak the local language, which is called Benuak. He'll describe how Nkuni Pasek is a center of shamanistic knowledge and practice, and how he found himself observing and participating in rituals known as Belian ceremonies. We'll close part one with his decision to study to become a shaman himself, a process that he will recount in detail in part two. Here's my conversation with Richard Payne. Richard, you and I have known each other for quite some time. Quite some time. Over 10 years, I believe. Over 10 years. We yeah. did graduate work together, and we've we've known each other. However, in all of this time, you and I have never really talked about what you've studied and what you work on. So you study anthropology. I do. And you have actually lived in Indonesia. Your focus has been Indonesia, right? Yes, I did two years of ethnographic field work in Indonesian Borneo, uh, which is uh, part of Borneo called Kalimantan. And when did you when did you live there? Uh, between two thousand four and two thousand six. Okay, so you you spent two years there, and and in order to go there. You know, there's obviously something that, that brought you to that place and caused you to want to study this. So I was wondering to start off, if you could talk a little bit about some of the languages that you've studied. You're obviously, uh, so you grew up in Chicago, is that right? Yeah, so I grew up in Chicago. I, I guess my first formal foreign language of study was French, which I began in third grade. Don't ask me any French questions, <laughs> I won't, I won't. Um, then... In college, I took two years of Japanese, and then uh, in order to do my field work in Indonesia, I first studied Indonesian, Bahasa Indonesia, the national language of Indonesian, and then once I moved into my field site, I began to learn the local language, which is called Bahasa Benuak. You studied Bahasa Indonesia, which is uh, the national language that um, that many people know there. That's sort of the lingua franca in Indonesia. That's correct. Bahasa Indonesia is the lingua franca. And Indonesia has been very successful in educating uh, almost 100% of its population uh, spread across 17,000 islands uh, to speak the national language. Okay, so... Wherever you go, you can you can speak this language. Yes. In Indonesia. Yes. And people understand you. Yes. And they'll speak back to you in Bahasa Indonesia or Indonesian. Yes. There are rumors of really isolated villages in Java where many people still don't speak Indonesian. But for the most part, everywhere you go, everyone will know how to speak the national language. Okay. So why Indonesian? Why Indonesia? What is it that drew you to this part of the world and well, I had traveled there in college, and I had studied wider history of Southeast Asia in college, and I was interested in environmental issues and was working at an environmental NGO think tank and doing a lot of secondary research on forestry and other environmental issues in Indonesia. But I found I was getting bored with looking at the world through a computer screen from the desk of my office. And so I decided I wanted to do my own first-hand research there in the country. Okay, yeah. So you, uh, if, if memory serves correctly, you studied forestry as well. So you have, you have a degree yeah, in forestry. I have a master's in forestry. Okay. You were saying that um, you were talking about how you learned Bahasa Indonesia, Indonesian, and you studied this in an academic way, right? Yeah. Well, I started actually at a language school in Yogyakarta, Indonesia, on okay. Java. I went there for several summers in a row and took one-on-one -on -one classes with teachers. A school for foreigners 
to teach Indonesian. That was the first time I studied formally. And then you, you went to Indonesia to live for two years. Yeah, so I first had a Fulbright-Hayes doctoral dissertation research fellowship that allowed for my first year of research in Indonesia. And of course, by that time, I already had a background in Bahasa, Indonesia, and I found a suitable village and a place in the village, a house to live in. How, so, did, you, how did you decide what part of Indonesia to, to go to to do your fieldwork? So in? I went on several trips before I got my fellowship, and based on just talking with different people, went to different regions. I knew I wanted to go to East Kalimantan because at that time I thought I wanted to do a more environmental dissertation project. And so I just spoke with people and on their recommendation, went to several different places to kind of look at what the situation was like and would it be a livable situation for me. And from that, I settled on one region. And I met a guy in Jakarta named Martinez Nanang, who uh, invited me to go specifically to his village oh, okay. and said, if you come to this village, you can stay with my family. And I ended up living in his uncle's house for two years. Uh, okay. Okay. So, so you I had, had a... a I kind of through this accidental meeting, right. okay. had an entry into a village where, where I made my home for... For two years, yeah. For two years. Uh, you decided that you wanted to go there. You had somebody who basically offered, you know, stay with my uncle, stay in my uncle's house. Yeah. And you were in Jakarta at the time when you were figuring this out. So then how do you get from Jakarta to, to the village? Well, you have to fly to the coastal city of Balikpapan, which is an old oil city on the east coast of Kalimantan, actually founded by Royal Dutch Shell, because during Dutch colonialism, there was a, that's when they started drilling for oil there. Then you have to go inland to the provincial capital, which is Samarinda. And when I first went there, the only way to the village was up the Mahakam River by a riverboat ferry. And that takes all night long, all day and all night, to get go up the Mahakam River to the town of Malak. And then from Malak, you go inland away from the river into the different villages of the ethnic group that I did my research with. Okay. You have a, a long journey, really, to get from Jakarta to... It's a long journey. ...the yeah. place where you... Yeah. Uh, it's a little live. easier today because there's an airport in the region and also a very bad road. And sometimes it's preferable still to take the riverboat ferry. You knew that you were going to stay in this area, in this, in this village. You're going to be living with this ethnic group. So what is the name of the village and what is the name of the ethnic group that you, that you lived with? The ethnic group that I studied is called the Benuak. So the Benuak are a part of a larger ethnic grouping called Dayaks, D-A-Y-A-K. The Dayak is kind of an ethnic geographic catch-all, kind of like European, and it refers to all of the indigenous upriver inland ethnic groups who live in Borneo. There are over easily over a hundred different Dayak ethnicities and languages. So it's a huge group of people. Yeah, it's a huge group of people, but they're referred to collectively by this term, Dayak. And so when people outside of Kalimantan think of the indigenous people of that island, they think of Dayaks. Those people are Dayak. And people have asked, where does the word come from? In Benuak, Dayak means literally upriver. So it refers to people who live upriver, away from the coasts where the ethnic group is predominantly Malay-speaking and predominantly Muslim. So what, what is the name of the village in which you lived? The village that I lived in is called Enkuni Pasek. You arrive at this village. On the 
recommendation of this person you knew in Jakarta. Yeah. And how do you how do you introduce yourself? How do you end up staying in this house? Well, my way in was my introduction, this guy I'd met in Jakarta. And it turns out that the people I lived with had had foreigners stay with them before for shorter periods of time. So I was a category of person that they were used to. And so... Why was that? People like to study this region. Okay. Yeah. And uh, so there had been several researchers come through this village of Nkuni before. So you show up and what do they do? What do they say? Or what do you say? Well, I explained to them what my purpose was and what I planned to do and roughly how long I intended to stay. And people were, I, I had a very lucky situation where people were very welcoming and very friendly and we got along extremely well. It was amazing, actually, how kind of frictionless moving into this new world was. So you just show up and you're like, here I am. And they're like, oh, great. Welcome. More or less. <laughs> Here's a place where you can live for two years. More or less. And they gave me a very nice room in their house. And we developed, and I still have very close ties, almost familial ties with this family right. today. And of course, I showed up knowing Bahasa Indonesia on one level. There was a lot of vocabulary that I wasn't familiar with that I very quickly caught up on, especially vocabulary related to farming. People, the Dayak communities in inland Kalimantan practice a form of agriculture called Swidin agriculture. Swidin agriculture? Yes. So okay. Swidin agriculture was formerly referred to as slash and burn, okay. which is now considered to be a more pejorative term. It basically involves you take a small plot of forest, about a hectare, you cut down the trees in this plot, you burn the trees to create the ash, which creates the nutrients for the plot, and then you grow your crops in that hectare of land. Uh, and the primary crop that they grow is upland rice, so dry hill rice agriculture practice in these rotating fields. So you farm your hectare for a year or two, and then you move to the next patch of forest. And then that former field, you leave fallow, and it eventually, over a period of 20 years or so, grows back to a secondary forest, which you then return to later, cut down, and again, burn. And so the process repeats itself. That makes sense. So you, you move to this farming community, essentially. So it's clear that there were fields that were being used for rice, and then there were areas where there was, where you have fallow fields. Was it heavily wooded? Was it mostly fields? How, how does it appear, this, this area? It appears like a patchwork of field and secondary forest. Many, many years, actually, beginning in the early 1980s, the region experienced, for the first time, catastrophic forest fires. We think, you know, we talk about climate change now as something that's new and urgent, but the people in this part of East Kalimantan were experiencing climate change in the early 80s. Wow. Like, this isn't new yeah. to them. Right. Uh, and the, these forest fires really changed the ecology. So what used to be uh, primary rainforest was mostly destroyed through these recurrent forest fires. So it's now more of a patchwork of secondary forest, uh, so structurally less complex, less biodiverse. And how about the, the, the village itself, the houses, the stores? How big is it? What are, what are the buildings like? What is it, you know, how are people living in this area? Uh, so people have their own individual homes. Uh, Everyone there has a home constructed by themselves, made out of wood. Some of the villages still have, traditionally, the Benoak and other Dayaks lived in longhouses, okay. which is a single structure, like a, in the shape of a very long uh, rectangle. One side of that is a large common room 
that runs the length of the building. And then the other is a series of apartments that people would live in. So formerly a single village would be a single longhouse. Which must have been quite large then. Could be quite large. Okay. And they were measured in how many doors there were ah, okay. along the common room. Uh, most of those had been uh, deconstructed and people had taken the, the wood to construct their own individual homes. Uh, and in Cooney, there was one remnant longhouse, which was very, it was more square than long, only four doors long, which okay. was relatively short. Um, a couple other villages had larger longhouses. But for the most part, people had moved away from uh, living in the longhouse to living in their own individual homes. And so what was the house that you lived in like? It seems like it must have been relatively large if you had your own space and you were able to live somewhat independently, but together with, with this family as well. Yeah, it was a fairly large well, wood frame house. Okay. Um, with a kitchen in back, a room for the parents and their adult, another room for their adult children, and uh, had an upstairs room that they allowed me to stay in. And can you talk a little bit about this family with whom you lived? So the man of the family, the head of the family, was a man named Pak Badong. And he was, when I moved in, the mayor of the village. And so he was a highly respected local political leader and also someone who's highly respected for his knowledge of local traditional law and custom and ritual knowledge, although he himself was not a ritual practitioner. And did he have any children living with him as well? So he had five children. He and his wife, Sabina, had five children. And their youngest daughter and her husband was also living in the house when I moved in. And their other four adult children were living in various places around the region. So you lived in this house and you already spoke Bahasa Indonesia. Yeah. And you were learning agricultural terms and other parts of the language that you might not have known before you went to live there. But that's is how much was that language being used in the household and how much was it, how much was it being used in the village in which you lived and how much was the local language part of daily life then? So that's a good question. When I showed up, people spoke Bahasa Indonesia to me. And when they were speaking to each other, they spoke their local language, Benoit. Uh, unless that person was also like me, not from their ethnic group. So I was immediately immersed in an environment where everyone around me was speaking Benoit to each other. And so one of my first orders of business was to start learning this language that everyone was communicating to themselves in. You learned Indonesian. You learned it with an instructor. You learned it with a textbook. You learned it in a formal way before going to Indonesia. Yeah. But with Benoak, you don't have any way to learn it from a book. You no. have to just learn it from everyday experience. Exactly. So how, how did you approach that? The first thing you do, of course, is you ask people, what is your word for this? What is your word? So you just collect lists of words, but you also uh, listen to what people are saying to each other and try to glean words as they're used in conversation. This is at first extremely difficult. Right. <laughs> I can uh, imagine. Because one of the primary obstacles that you first have to overcome is even knowing when you're listening to people speak in real-time conversation, what is even a word? Right. How so do you're you... listening to a string of discourse. And in Benoit, especially, it's made difficult by the fact that the language has an inordinate number of glottal stops in its words, uh, which cuts the word up in different ways, unexpected ways often. And so... I was very often asking people, I heard someone say this word, and I'd say the word, what does it mean? 
And they say, no, there's no word like that. So you have trouble identifying where one where word does, started and ended. Exactly. Where does one word stop and the next word start? Can you talk a little bit about how long it took? How, you know, when did you start being able to communicate some basic ideas and then how it progressed over time? Well, I'd say it took about a year to get to a very basic level. I mean, obviously, I'm doing lots of other things, pursuing other questions, but it was a slow learning curve. And at the end of a year, I was still, I found myself still asking some very basic questions <laughs> about okay. the language. Yeah. But after that, it began to come a little more quickly, where in the second year, I began to make progress more rapidly. And that's when people, for the first time, would speak to me in Benoit and not in Indonesian. So you studied Indonesian, and then you, all, you learned Benoit, the, the Benoit language. And did knowing Indonesian help you to learn Benoit? What is the relationship between these two languages? That's an excellent question. So... There is certainly some overlap between the two languages, especially in specific words, much like you have similarities between English and French. However, Indonesian and Benoit are Austronesian languages. They're in the Austronesian language family. The Austronesian language family is the language family that has the widest geographical distribution in the world. It's thought to have originated in Taiwan and is still spoken, uh, or Austronesian languages are still spoken among indigenous people in, on the peripheries of Taiwanese society. From there, it spread south into Malaysia, Philippines, Indonesia, and then east across the Pacific Ocean as far as Easter Island. Wow. So a Hawaiian is an Austronesian language. Other languages of the Pacific are Austronesian languages. Indonesian, Tagalog. And to the West, Malagasy, the national language of Madagascar, is also an Austronesian language. So it's really a, a globe-spanning language. It's a globe-spanning language. So Benoit and the other nearby Dayak languages in the region that I lived in, in Kalimantan, are members of an Austronesian language family within this larger group called the Barito languages. Barito is the name of a river in South Kalimantan. And one of the amazing things is that the Barito languages are spoken in kind of southeast central Kalimantan, and also in Madagascar. Malagasy is a Barito language, and we don't really know how, but at some point in the midst of past prehistory, yeah. Madagascar was settled by people who came from south central Borneo. That's so crazy. It's crazy. Wow. It's crazy. And we even, not only are there linguistic similarities between Malagasy and the people of central Borneo, but a lot of the mortuary rituals that are practiced in central Madagascar are very similar to the mortuary rituals that the indigenous Barito-speaking Dayak people of Kalimantan also practice. So it's really not just language, it's really a shared culture or a shared foundation exactly. of culture. Exactly. That's exactly right. Okay. Wow. Yeah. So Benoit is one of the Barito languages. So while it has some uh, superficial similarities with Indonesian, uh, taxonomically, it's uh, surprisingly more closely related to Malagasy than it is to <laughs> wow. Malay, which is the foundation of the Indonesian language, Bahasa Indonesia. So does knowing Indonesian give you any insight at all into 
knowing Benoit? Oh, yes, it certainly helped. Okay. It certainly helped. And thankfully, they have a very similar grammatical structure and syntactic structure. So uh, it's really just a matter of learning a whole new set of vocabulary. Right. Why did you think it was important to know this language? Because one could think that you could figure things out just by knowing Indonesian since everybody spoke it. Why did you take on this task, this monumental task? Well, this is the basic, I think, uh, idea behind cultural anthropology is that to be truly a participant observer, you want to communicate with people in the language that they're primarily using. So it was necessary, really, as an anthropologist for you to be able, to, as a cultural anthropologist, for you to be able to communicate in this way with them. I would say so, yes. And it's certainly possible to do uh, research only in Indonesian. What would you miss if you, if you don't speak? What would you have missed if you didn't speak Benoak? Well, it's hard to say, but I think you would miss a lot of detail, uh, a lot of nuance in what people are trying to say. And you would also miss out on a lot of ritual language and ritual knowledge, which ended up being the subject of my research project. Let's talk about that. In this first year, you're, you're getting your bearings. You're learning the language slowly. You're figuring out the, the basics of the language and the foundation that will later allow you to progress more rapidly in the language. What are some of the other things that you're interested in? What are you looking at, maybe from your anthropological uh, point of view? Well, I immediately became very interested in a subject which I had not really thought about ever before, and I kind of really backed into this, but I became very quickly interested in the local practice of Benoit shamanism. Why did it come to your mind as something to study? Well, I backed into it first by attending shamanistic rituals, which I had really no knowledge of before. I found them personally fascinating, but I was also fascinated and interested in the discourses around shamanism, how they intersected with discourses about religion and identity and citizenship in the Indonesian nation. Can you talk about the way that your perception of this evolved, how it kind of deepened over time? For one thing, through the process of attending these rituals, I got to know the people who were practicing them. I spent more time interviewing them, digging into their daily lives and routines. And so I ended up basically following a lot of shamans as they moved around from village to village. It turned out that at that time, Nkuni Pasek was kind of an epicenter of shamanic knowledge. And the shamans who lived there were highly renowned across the region, in high demand across the region in other, from other far-flung places. And so we're constantly moving about from one village to the next. And so this demand for ritual knowledge, which seemed to be in scarce supply, was uh, something that I became interested in, and also just in the lives of the shamans themselves. And so I just spent a lot of time following them around and observing and asking questions about what they were doing and about shamanist shamanistic knowledge and practice. When you're living in this area, when you're living in Nkuni Pasek, you realize, you know, what's what's going on here? What's the what's really interesting that's happening here? And you realize that it's sort of a center of shamanism and shamanistic knowledge. Right. With the irony that there's a, an incredibly strong demand for this knowledge and for this ritual practice, and yet almost no recruitment uh, of younger generations into the practice. Okay. So uh, the shamans who lived in Nkuni Pasek mostly were senior citizens, very elderly, and they didn't have students of their own. Why not? Well, this gets to a lot of more complex questions of identity and citizenship and religion in Indonesia, 
One problem in Indonesia is that while the nation state says that they guarantee religious freedom, you have to belong to one of the six religions that the government recognizes. And shamanism is not one Shaman, of them? Benwak shamanism is not one of them. Okay. And you cannot be an atheist. It's illegal to be an atheist in Indonesia. Wow. Okay. So there's the, the, you can't say none of the above. Okay. Right? So you have to choose one of you the six religions. You have to choose your religion is on your state-issued identity card without... A membership in a religion, you're really not a full citizen wow. of the Indonesian nation. What what are the possible religions that you can be in Indonesia? So I'm guessing Islam, Christianity. So Islam is the biggest. Okay. Christianity is divided between Protestantism and Catholicism. Okay. Which they consider to be two separate choices. Buddhism is one. Hinduism is one. Hinduism mostly is confined to Bali. And then Confucianism was recently readmitted after being kicked out of the official <laughs> okay. religions. Uh, so now Confucianism is the sixth choice. When you say, we, you talk about shamanism or Benawak shamanism to be a little more precise, what, what exactly does that mean? What is shamanism? Oh boy, what is shamanism? So it revolves around a set of different rituals where a ritual specialist, the shaman, basically makes a series of exchanges with a group of spirits or spirit people in order to achieve some desired outcome. And that desired outcome is often to heal a person who is sick but there are a number of other different aims that different shamanistic rituals hope to achieve or accomplish. And in the case of Benawak shamanism, what was the primary thing that people would ask the shamans for? People who felt certain illnesses, especially in cases where people said that they felt ill and had gone to the hospital, but the doctors in the hospital said, well, we can't find anything that's wrong with you according to our understanding of medical science. But the people still feel ill. And so in that case, a shamanistic ceremony would be held with the purpose of making the people feel better. People could also have specific illnesses such as illness of the stomach or there's one ritual that is exclusively for people who have been bitten by rabid dogs. Oh, wow. <laughs> okay. So there are also more specifically rituals for specific medical problems. The type of shamanistic ritual they do, the general name is Belion. And there are a number of different Belions done for different purposes, done by different people. And so... Usually, one person is a specialist in a particular type of belion. Okay. A belion is really a ritual that's used to carry out or to perform a specific function or to carry out a specific goal, to realize a specific goal. Yeah, usually to cure a person who, of some illness. Okay. And you mentioned that that's not necessarily the only thing that they're used for, even though it's primarily what they're used for. Are there, what are some other non-cure illness things that Belions might be used for? Uh, there's one set of rituals that's done specifically for young children, newborns, and the purposes of those rituals is basically not to cure them of any sickness, but to ensure good luck, good fortune and a stronger soul in those children so that they will be healthier and have prosperity later in life. Some of the larger rituals involve cleaning uh, not just a person, but an entire family or even an entire village environment. Oh, wow. Okay. So, uh, Cleaning of what? Why are they not clean? So the Benoit believe in a world of spirits and spirits that can 
give good fortune or bring misfortune to people. And also certain acts can also bring misfortune to people or to communities. And so the ritual, the bellion called Naliten Tauten, which means to clean the year, is used to basically wipe away any misfortune that has been created through people's actions, often unknowingly through the course of the year, including misfortune caused by incest or by accidentally insulting or upsetting ancestral spirits who are thought to live in the village. And the incest can yeah, be not just from humans, although human incest, of course, is for... Uh, brings misfortune. Brings heavy misfortune, <laughs> but also incest of domestic animals or other animals living in the village environment can also bring misfortune. Does that problem happen a lot? Uh, people say yes. If you look at dogs, that they hear, they <laughs> commit incest uh, <laughs> okay. frequently. Did, did you ever observe this? I when you were there? did not observe the dogs, but uh, I take their word for it. Okay, right. Wow. Um, so you realized that, that shamanism was going to be something that you focused in on a lot while you were there. And how did you, how did you get into this? How did you, you know, you, you had an initial observation of it, but how did you enter into that world and really try to understand how it worked? Well, these rituals were really going on uh, all the time. Okay. And so I spent most of my time uh, attending them, observing them, interviewing people who were uh, both patients and practitioners or people just observing from the community. I spent a fair amount of time participating in them, sometimes as a dancer myself. Oh, wow. And eventually I studied in an official capacity as an apprentice shaman with three different teachers. Wow. So you trained as a shaman. I began training as a shaman. This is the end of part one. In part two, Richard will describe how he studied to become a shaman. We'll talk about what you need to do to initially ask to study with a shaman, and we'll go into the specifics of the rituals that he learned. We'll discuss the structure of the spiritual worldview that the shamans participate in, and we'll discover what happened to him when he deliberately broke one of the rules that he was supposed to obey as a shaman in training. Stay tuned for the next episode of Said and Done, coming on May 12, 2022.